welcome to tonight's tale, the Fairy Tale Theater Podcast. It is hosted by myself, Emily. I'm from Atlanta, Georgia, and my co-host Eric is with me. Hello, I'm Eric from New York. And today we are joined by our guest host, Melina. Hi, I'm Melina. I'm in Tloyoak, Nunavut, but I'm originally from Ontario. So Melina, tell us a little bit about yourself. How long have you been a fan of fairy tale theater? How did you first discover it? So when I was about seven years old, I was at the library with my parents and it was the good old VHS days. And then I saw this VHS of The Little Mermaid, and it was probably my favorite story at that time. And I had never seen a live action adaptation of it before. So I got really excited, took it home, watched it, realized there were more episodes, and it just kind of took off from there. So I've been a fan of the show and of Shelley's ever since I was seven. And I started collecting vintage fairy tale books because of her. Oh, that's wonderful. That's A pretty similar story, I think, to most of us. I remember going to the library to check out all the different VHS copies. Eric, you said the same thing. Yes, I loved especially those Playhouse video, the golden covers. Oh, yeah. They had a list of all the different episodes inside the cover. And my sister and I used to check off the ones we'd found. (laughs) So... Melina, you remember the first fairy tale theater episode you ever saw. I envy that. I do not remember. (laughs) I don't. I grew up with so many of them. I can't remember which one came first. Yeah, I don't think I remember which one came first either. Tonight, we are discussing The Boy Who Left Home to Find Out About the Shivers, which was based on the fairy tale by the Brothers Grimm. Eric, do you have the background information on this one? The Boy Who Left Home to Find Out About the Shivers first aired on September 17th, 1984. It was part of season three and it was episode seven. Very cool. So this one came pretty much in the middle of the show. The first thing I like to talk about is what first springs to mind when we think about this episode? What do we remember about the cast, the costumes, the sets, the music, the story itself? I think what stands out to me the most is Vincent Price and Christopher Lee and I just love how they were both horror movie stars and hammer horror stars as well so it's very fitting that they appear together in this episode they're also BFFs so I think that's super sweet Peter McNichol is just hilarious he's just so funny Oh, and I so- also remember him. He's so funny. <laughs> so and I remember him as the camp counselor in the second Adams family movie. <laughs> I can't not talk about Angelica if the opportunity arises. So that was my little segue. <laughs> hey, she was also in fairy tale theater. <laughs> Indeed. But I remember I love anything that's medieval and has to do with castles and supernatural. So I love like the look of the tavern when you first go in. I love the look of when he's just walking around Transylvania and it's just very dark and there's mist. It looks very nostalgic. It looks like an old hammer horror film. It kind of has that glaze to it, which I really like. I completely agree. That's a great answer. A lot of which I also was going to say, but you said it a lot better than me. (laughs) Eric, what do you first remember when you think of this episode? I do also agree. I like the atmosphere of it. I think that it stands out of all the episodes because of the very gothic elements of it and the atmosphere of it and the spookiness and the supernatural part of it. It definitely stands out among the other episodes. And I know, Emily, that Shelly talked to you about this episode in particular, right, when you met her? She did. Yes, she she did. Actually, I asked about it because it, it always struck me as such a unique episode. And she said it always struck her that the story, although she really liked the story, it would have been better suited to her later series, which was Nightmare Classics, which I can totally see. If you've seen Nightmare Classics, she's right. It would have fit right in. But I think think she said it was Bridget Terry insisted on it being under fairy tale theater because it was a tale by the Brothers Grimm. And she's going, I like the episode. I'm proud of the episode, but I don't think it quite fit in. And my response to her is, that's kind of why everybody loves it, because it is so unique. It is so different. 
So I see both sides of this one, but Shelly definitely had some memories of Boy Who Left Home. Definitely. Yeah, I love that it stands out. I agree. I agree with you. So how familiar were you, Melina, with the original source material, the tale by the mother's Yes. Birth? <laughs> yeah. So wasn't the original title, the story of youth who went forth to learn what fear was or something along wow. those lines? I am uh, impressed. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I was Thank told you. earlier that I actually was a German major and I read this story in the original German years ago. And that that is a more literal. Yeah, I have copies that are like the direct translation from German that are from like the 1920s. So that's what, yeah, the, what it came youth, up as. I, yeah. as I recall, yeah, it's the, the youth who went forth to learn what fear was, which... Yeah. It makes a lot more sense in German and English. That's a very clunky title. <laughs> right? Exactly. I, I love how spooky it is. It literally says spooky in like the first paragraph of the story. <laughs> I will admit, I know I read the story years and years ago, but I do not remember it that clearly. Eric, do you remember it? I don't actually. I know I read it years ago because it's a very short one. And I bought the, when I bought the Brothers Grimm, I bought that really pretty leather bound Aww. compilation of all the Brothers Grimm right. stories. And I know that I read that one because it was very short and it does follow the episode very, very well. That's what I remember. I mean, maybe that's why I don't remember the specifics that well, because I remember fairy tale theater pretty much got it. I remember the title vividly because it was so clunky. I do think, Melina, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the ending is a bit different in the fairy tale from the episode. It's true. The ending is different because I know at the ending of the episode, he then wants to go and find out what the blues are and he gets the shivers by her talking about wanting babies. And which, then... <laughs> which is adorable. That was very cute. I know. And then the ending of the original one, she takes a bunch of cold water and little minnows and throws them on him while he's in bed. And he woke up and cried out, oh, dear wife, I'm shivering, I'm shivering. Now at last I know what the shivers are. So they kind of changed the ending to make it. I don't know, that would have been funny, though, just to see Peter McNichol covered in cold water and like little fish. <laughs> yeah. Peter yeah. Hill just I holding think... a bucket over him. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, you want to know? I'll show you. <laughs> But other than that, it's fairly true. I mean, some of the darker parts of the story were cut out of the episode. I mean, the black cat runs past him in one scene, but in this too, there's like a black cat and a black dog that like approach him and he ends up killing both of them. So what? I can see why that was cut out. So I can see why that is cu- was cut out. I'm glad um, I do, I do like- remember that part. Yeah, yeah. So like with the bodies, there's a scene in the book where he goes and takes down dead bodies because he doesn't realize they're dead and he thinks that they're cold. (laughs) So wow, that part was yeah, it's like very, very dark. Interesting. But in terms of the plot, they stayed fairly true to the plot. Starting to see some parallels. I know some people correlate this fairy tale with being connected to the Arthurian legends. I guess I'm not the expert on those by any stretch of the imagination, but from what I gather, Lancelot had to go pass a a test of bravery in a haunted castle. I'm also thinking the German major in me, the legend of Siegfried, and he was famous for having no fear. And just what you're saying, I'm going, that's absolutely something Siegfried would do. He just, it wasn't that he was especially brave. He was just that dumb. (laughs) I'm just seeing parallels in the Arthurian legends and the great Germanic legends that the story obviously came from. I mean, I could definitely see that. I can definitely see the connection to Arthurian legend because we definitely have the elements of magic and we have oh, yeah. we have the very medieval atmosphere. I don't know. It's kind of cool. That's a good point you made, Emily. I like that. Cool. So we're going to start with our recap. And of course, like every episode, it begins with an intro by our beloved Shelley Duvall. Join us for tonight's tale about a boy who didn't know what fear was until he met face to face with, oh well, you'll find out soon enough. From the Brothers Grimm, the boy who left home to find out about the shivers. 
She does specify that it's from the Brothers Grimm. And having talked to her, I understand why she did that. She probably felt that a lot of people are going, why are you including this dark story? You know, like last week we had Jack and the Beanstalk. What's this? I think she wanted to emphasize that this was a fairy tale. Any thoughts on Shelley's intro? I love how you can hear like the owl hooting or one of the birds start hooting. And then she kind of like looks behind her, like pretending to be freaked out. I oh, think that's, that's really right. cute. That was adorable. They love that owl sound effect. They just kept using it. They it did. Points. Let me just use this in they all the episodes. They used it a lot. <laughs> they used it again in uh, Legend of Sleepy Hollow, didn't they? Yeah, and Rapunzel, and can't even think of all. The, there's so many. Anytime there was like a nighttime scene, they used that owl. I'm sure it was somewhere in Hansel and Gretel. I'm sure it Definitely was. Definitely in Hansel and Gretel. Yeah, you're right. I know I've heard that at special effects several times. So after we get Shelley's intro, we get Vincent Price's beautiful narration. When I first think of the episode, probably the first thing I thought of is, like Melina said, the great Vincent Price. I cannot remember a time when I didn't know who Vincent Price was. He was everywhere. I mean, I remember him in the Ten Commandments, and I remember him being the magic mirror in Snow White, and just a great actor, and he did such a beautiful narration in this. So he sets the scene. Long ago, in the mysterious and forbidding land of Transylvania, a father lived with his two sons. The elder was, like everyone else in the village, scared of his own shadow. But the younger one was innocent and unafraid of anything. I made a note. I'm pretty sure this is the only fairy tale theater episode that is set in Eastern Europe. Most of them are Western Europe. Then we had Rip Van Winkle in the USA. We had Nightingale in China and Aladdin in Arabia. But pretty sure this is the only one set in Eastern Europe that I could think of anyway. Yeah, I think you're right. I, I can't think of one. I don't think the original story is set anywhere. It's probably set in Germany, but the style they were going to, I understand why they did Transylvania. And then they even bring up Vlad the Impaler yet. So <laughs> they were going full Dracula with this, the more you follow this story. Which is very yeah. fitting. It is. Christopher Lee playing Dracula. <laughs> Christopher Lee and Vincent Price had actually just done a documentary on Dracula. So... <laughs> We have the scene where we're first introduced to Martin, played by our adorable Peter McNichol, and his father and his brother, played by Jeff Corey and Gary Springer, and just introduces us to his life. So, Eric, what did you think of the opening scene where we first meet Martin? I love that we're introduced to the family, the father, the brother, mm -hmm. and the whole exposition of meeting them. That was very cool. You're automatically set up with the family and the father, who's very superstitious. And the brother, and too. the brother the same way, with the ladder, not walking under the ladder. And I, don't know, I just love Peter McNichol. He's so quirky and, and weird. He's fun. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I didn't think the interactions between the brothers was that great. I kind of felt there was some chemistry missing between Peter McNichol and I think his name was Gary Springer, who played the brother. Just, I don't know, seemed a little stiff. But Jeff Corey as the father, I loved going kiss the rabbit's foot and <laughs> the you know what, Hazel. He was very committed. So then we get, well, I mean, basically the the point of that scene is to set up that Martin is the odd one out. Everyone else is superstitious, scared of their own shadow. Martin's not scared of anything. Our next scene, we have, <laughs> I don't know the actor's name. I just wrote down Stu Pickles because I knew he was the voice of Stu Pickles in Rugrats. <laughs> I should know his name. I don't. I just wrote Stu Pickles. <laughs> He's made up his mind that all he wants is to get the shivers. Ah, it's just a stage he's going through. I remember when I was a boy, all I wanted to do was think of naked Greek statues. Creepy. Yeah, <laughs> that was creepy. That was one of the creepier lines in the entire show. And he decides he's going to... I'll give him a scare he'll never forget. Raising my hand here, why is it so important for Martin to learn about fear? I don't understand why this is necessary. Why do we need to scare him? I don't know. I don't know, to be honest. I feel honest. like they just think he's... Maybe they just think he's really naive and needs to be scared to learn that the world isn't fun. <laughs> I that's, don't know. No, that's a good answer. 
Maybe they think they're protecting him by giving him a scare. That's a very good answer. That makes a lot of sense. They're scared of everything and he's not. So maybe they think they're protecting him. Mm. (laughs) See, the trouble is Martin's never been very bright. Once he gets an idea in his head, there's not a whole lot in there to distract him. Our next shot we have, actually, it was a very cool shot of Peter McNichol climbing the church steeple at night. Pretty minimal set, but I thought it worked. We have a cute moment with the sexton dressed up as a very unconvincing ghost. I watched this as a kid. Y'all watched this as kids. Were any of you scared by that ghost? No. Negative. <laughs> That's what I thought. <laughs> and I figured it was meant that way. I think Shelley was probably wisely trying to give the atmosphere of fright, but actually keep it friendly for kids without scaring them. And so that ghost appearing, I thought was pretty funny. I thought so as a kid. It was giving me very that scene in Beetlejuice where they kind of <laughs> where, where, oh where they yes. where they put on the sheets. <laughs> Making the same sound. They were making the same sound. Woo! Yeah, like the woo! (laughs) Oh, so funny. And as I recall, Lydia in Beetlejuice had the same reaction as Martin. It's not working. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. You're trespassing on church property. You know that. I think you better leave before I call the deacon. Now look, I don't know what you want, but I'm telling you for the last time, either tell me who you are or else. And he shoves him off the bell tower. Yeah, he does that in the story too. He breaks his leg in the story. (laughs) I mean, this is very British humor. I mean... He shoved a man off a bell tower. He broke his leg. But it's funny more than anything. But it's funny. Especially the way Martin just goes on ringing the bell going, I warned him. <laughs> <laughs> so nonchalant. I could have I could have broken his neck, but I'm here to ring this bell. Yeah. Hey, I gave him a fair shot. <laughs> so I think Shelly handled this story very well, where atmospherically you feel it's very creepy, but actually it's very funny. Our next scene, we have Martin going back to his home and the sexton is there on crutches and the father basically disowns him. Heavens above, you bring nothing but bad luck to this house. I I, I can't stand the sight of you. You give me the shivers. What? Here, here, here. Here's a hundred... Fifty dollars. What have I done? Did I just take them what and you... go out into the world and never tell a soul where you come from or who your father is? You, you mortify me. Doesn't really explain to Martin why he's being disowned. Martin hasn't quite figured out that the sexton's broken foot is because he was pushed off a bell tower. I don't think Martin ever made that connection. <laughs> to this day, I don't think Martin has figured that part out. <laughs> Our next shot is yes. walking through the graveyard. Yeah, so walk into the graveyard and spooky, scary skeletons should be playing in the background. But, um, (laughs) and then there's like that cat that runs by, but then he sees this like poster that catches his eye. And I love how they made it look like that old school parchment when you would like dye it in tea bags for like history projects. Yeah. Like, do you remember doing that in school? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Like I, in that time period, actually, <laughs> in the in the mid eighties, right. yes, I did. And I love this subtle detail of just like the body hanging and swinging as he picks up the ad. Because in the original story, he goes to the gallows to try and get the shivers, but oh, that wouldn't right. be too child appropriate. So I can see why they cut that down. <laughs> But then I love how he just decides to go on this like quest on his own to go to this castle because he just thinks that ghosts will give me the shivers. That seems the most logical. Well, can't fault Mm -hmm. his reasoning there. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. I don't blame him. He grew up in a superstitious family. Ghosts probably did freak them out. I just, I love that scene with like the fog and the... And the lightning bolt. Don't skip the lightning bolt. Yes. Oh, yes. Yes. That was a pretty big special effect for fairy tale theater it was he just misses the lightning bolt this is kind of a a little bit of a criticism i have of the episode 
part of the reason Martin's not scared of anything is he misses half of what happens. <laughs> He's just I know. the and other like, direction it, or walking away when it happens. Is it luck or is it just him not noticing? <laughs> is it just being oblivious? Yeah. I guess fairy tale theater balances it out because he does see his fair share of scary things and they don't bug him. Mm-hmm. But I kind of think like the lightning bolt just missing him. Later, you'll see an axe just miss him. You kind of feel like some of it's just pure dumb luck. So we get a another narration, I think, by Vincent Price saying he has to report to the Steak and Brew Inn. Did you notice how steak was spelled on the sign? Like they're going to burn you at the stake? <laughs> like, well, later he says the king is the son of Vlad the Impaler. So like dragon steak. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. Yeah. They, it's they very are, fitting. They are just running with this Dracula theme all throughout. <laughs> right. Like, did you come up with that yourself? <laughs> yes. Yes. I, I like that scene. It's very funny. And I love when we're introduced to Frank Zappa, because that's my favorite. He's my favorite. <laughs> Frank Zappa. He had no lines in the entire episode, and yet how did he nope. almost steal the show? <laughs> he was hysterical. It was so funny. Let me see. We, we get our appearance of Frank Zappa as Attila. I don't think mm. he's ever called that in the episode. I think that's just what they call him in the credits. And I won't say how old I was before I realized that was Frank Zappa. <laughs> I thought it was a real hunchback. I didn't know what to think of that until later when I realized who Frank Zappa was, I go... That's so Frank Zappa. That's such a Frank Zappa thing to do. (laughs) We also get our first intro of our lovely David Warner playing the innkeeper. You're looking for someone you won't find in here. Uh, I'm looking for King Vladimir's castle. Come in. Okay. Mm-hmm. I've been a fan of his for a long time. He was in fairy tale theater. He was also in the canon movie tales. I remember him being in A Christmas Carol. He's just a great actor I've always loved. We also see sweet Dana Hill as the princess. Every time a new one comes, it's the same thing. I have to go to my room. Aww. I love her. I miss her. She died far too young. And of course, our first appearance of Christopher Lee as King Vladimir. Whew. That was great casting, Shelly. Oh, I love that. It really was. It's just so fitting and it's so perfect. Yeah, Christopher <laughs> Lee made a great king. He was perfectly cast in this role. Yeah. And Such a great actor too. Oh, yeah. We miss him too. Yes. David Warner introduces him as... Ah, Your Excellency, Majesty. Uh, may I present King Vladimir? Vladimir. Vladimir the second. The fifth. The fifth. Uh, he's the son of Vlad the Impaler. Mm-hmm. Vlad the Impaler was a real historic figure who was the inspiration for Dracula. And I like how they mm-hmm. called him Bad Vlad. <laughs> right. It's so funny. <laughs> Little side note, they turned Vlad Dracul's castle into a bed and breakfast, and you can go and stay there, and you sleep in coffin-shaped beds. Oh, no, that's just wrong. (laughs) (laughs) It's just wrong in so many ways. I'll bet it's incredibly popular, too. I've been to the Lizzie Borden house in Massachusetts. I have no right to complain. That's really cool. Grizzly murders, of course, I'm on top of it. (laughs) (laughs) So we meet him, and he's just so, like, he is just kingly, and he was so tall. So I feel like his overall presence is just, like, it makes you want to watch as a kid, and even more so now, like, knowing more of his work. It's just... Yeah, very mesmerizing, I think. I completely agree. He's so tall and he's so... The word I wrote down in my notes was elegant. He's very elegant. Oh, that's... He's in an inn set. You know, he's surrounded by this inn and there's all these peasants around it. You, He walks in, you go, yeah, he's the king. (laughs) Yeah, he's in charge here. Yep, he has that presence. And again, we get a sweet little intro to Dana Hill. I think we get a flute solo and a little violin. Good evening, 
evening, sir. Oh, good evening. My name is Amanda. My name is Martin. Are you the night clerk? Oh, oh, yes. I hope I did not disturb your thoughts. Thoughts? Oh, no, I was just eating a peach. She looks so lovely. I always feel a little sad when I see her because we lost her far, far too young. Mm -hmm. So she introduces herself to Martin. Doesn't mention that she's the princess, but you know, fair enough. Why should she? And she tells Martin that he can take three things into the castle. I believe I remember that this does go back to the original fairy tale. Yes. I don't remember why that was important though. And I watched the episode and I still don't get why this was important. Do you know what three things he brings in the story? I know he took food, a plate, and drink. In, well, that's what he brought in the episode. What did he bring in the story? He replied, then give me fire, a lathe, la a L-A-T-H-E, and a woodcarver's bench and knife. Oh. Well, technically, yeah. four things. Technically, that's four things. <laughs> Learn to count. <laughs> <laughs> that's interesting. Yeah. I'm just pondering over this. So that is very different. In the episode, he's just going food, drink, and a plate to eat on. And I'm going, why is this? It's like a one-track mind. <laughs> Just give me food. Yeah. And the what, would, yeah, what would you guys ask for? Oh, that's a good question. If you could bring three things into a haunted castle, what would you guys bring? I guess the cell phone isn't a safe answer, right? <laughs> the fire makes sense because it's fire, like... Yeah, fire does make sense. Because it, otherwise it's dark. <laughs> <laughs> otherwise it's dark maybe i'd prefer it dark i don't know <laughs> maybe a blanket because uh, i have a feeling that castle gets awful drafty right mm -hmm. i'd probably ask for some sage and a little bit of salt <laughs> <laughs> edging your bets i was kind of more at the swiss army knife kind of <laughs> yeah you know i can whittle on some wood or defend myself if need be i think i that's more where i am although Let's be real. I never defend myself with a Swiss Army knife. I just scream and run. <laughs> <laughs> I am a very good screamer. I used to get hired at haunted houses. There you go. That's your really. Name. Oh my god, that's so yeah. cool. <laughs> In my eyes, it's cool. <laughs> yeah, I did. I used to work at a haunted house because I screamed so loud. Yeah, I used to scream myself hoarse. I couldn't do it for you know long hours. I could only do it for like. I don't know, maybe two hours. <laughs> There's your useless trivia about Emily. And no, I will not do it into the microphone. <laughs> yeah, that's a hidden talent that is best left hidden. Anyway, getting back to that, the narrator says Amanda had provided Martin with valuable information. And I was going, did she though? <laughs> maybe she did, but I think he kind of wasted it. He does use the plate. I think so. Later, but did he do anything special with that? woodcutter's bench in the story so in the story one of the ghouls tries to take it because he's just using it to like carve wood and just like sitting on it and in the story one of the ghouls tries to take it and he's like no it's mine <laughs> that's about it yeah that's about it <laughs> see he had the same idea as me swiss army knife just kind of whittle there's nothing else to do <laughs> whittle do away knitting. oh look you weren't gonna let me take my cell phone so <laughs> Would there even be service up there? <laughs> There's service in Transylvania. Well, I don't know. Are we doing it now or are we doing it? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> so our next shot after he gets his three things, then we are at the castle. And this is a pretty impressive set. I must say the exterior looked pretty cheesy early 80s computer graphics, but the interior, they've spent some money on that set. I loved it. There were cobs, yes. there were candlesticks, there was a skeleton just randomly strewn about, there were gargoyles. I loved this set. Mm -hmm. They must have had so much yeah. fun with it, just kind of making it look as much as Halloween as possible. <laughs> I would have had fun making that set. I love the gargoyles with just the eyes. That's so funny. Yeah, and I think we previously reviewed Beauty and the Beast and the interiors of that castle were pretty much a bunch of black curtains. Mm -hmm. This one. Yeah, they, that's a good point. They really pulled out everything for it. So yeah. And to make it look Very like cool. stone and yeah. And this set was the poster shot 
for. It the- was because the poster is them over the table with the skeleton, right? And he's holding a match or a candle exactly. in the poster. Yeah. Okay. This set pretty much summed up the entire episode, which I mean, it makes sense. Mm-hmm. They spend the most amount of time here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, have we mentioned that no one has ever come out alive from the castle? No, I don't think we oh, have. Yeah. I think we had one previous guy who made it one night. But no one yes. survived two nights. And Martin has right. to make it three. He's got to make it through all three. That's right. So we do have our first appearance of a ghost. And it's just a woman walking past. And Martin Do we has- know who she is? Like if it was so. anyone involved in the episode or if it was just a random... I think it was just a random extra. Yeah, but. I've just always been curious about that. And I feel like you would be the person to know. <laughs> I, I, well, thank you. But when I was watching it, I'm going, now that would have been a cool cameo for Shelly. <laughs> that would have been. It also would have been cool, like one of the, like if it was like Ingrid Pitt or one of the girls from like Hammer Horror, that would have been really cool. If it had been though, we would have gotten a close up. <laughs> We would have, yes. Oh, you're right. Wouldn't that but be yeah, cool if it had been like Hazel Court or <laughs> someone Ooh. like that? Oh, yeah. I speak hammer. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I think And then doesn't he, he just oh, shout and then his echo comes back? Yeah. Yeah, hello. <laughs> he sees a ghost. He sees a woman in white just kind of walking by. I mean... Oh, hello. Oh, hello. Hello! And just says, hello, what's up? No yeah. reaction. That's, no. That's it. Hey, what's up? And she kind of. Like, just, it's totally normal. <laughs> she half looks over, but keeps going, you know. She just, she, she's got her ghost business to do. And he calls out, oh, hello. And then he goes, oh, Echo. Oh. And I like half expected him to start yodeling. He's just playing with the Echo here. <laughs> Which is such a cute kid-like thing to do. I'm not sure how old Peter McNichol was when he did this. I want to say very early 20s. I know he'd already made Dragon Slayer, but that must have only been like maybe... Do you guys remember that movie? No. Dragon Slayer? (laughs) No. (laughs) Okay. I'll be honest. No, that's all right. It's a good movie. Well, I think that's the one that Peter McNichol was most well known for at that point in his career. And he played the young hero who slayed a dragon basically. Knowing Shelley's sense of humor, she took the hero, the young hero from that and made him the hero who doesn't know what fear is because he spent most of Dragon Slayer being scared out of his mind. <laughs> you can see how Shelley's mind works some of the times. But anyways, Dragon Slayer, I want to say he was like 18. So I would guess he would have been about- 20. It came out in 81. Okay. And this was 84? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So he would have been like 21, 22, something like that when he did this, which would have made sense. But very often with fairy tale theater, they cast actors that are older than their parts, but make them just seem naive. They did that with Goldilocks, Jack and the Beanstalk. Peter McNichol was certainly playing younger than he actually was. Okay. He had the baby face to match though, and still does have quite the baby face. He does. He had it. I watched all the seasons of Allie McBeal and he still had the baby face. (laughs) So we get Martin poking around the castle. He's playing with the echo. He's playing with a gargoyle who's about to grab him. And then sweet Amanda comes to his rescue and she saves him from the the gargoyle that was about to grab him. No, this is stone. Amanda, look. It's just cold, hard stone. It's carved into the wall. Martin, watch out. Yeah. It's so funny. It's carved to the wall, see? And I love how after he knocks it on the forehead, we get that shot of it just opening its eyes and then just like, ugh. Just crossing his <laughs> eyes going, ugh. <laughs> it's yeah. just stone. It can't hurt you. Ugh. So yeah, Amanda actually supposedly saved his life here. Although I'm not sure how the gargoyle was going to kill him by grabbing him, but I'm sure they would have figured out something. I don't know. But anyway, Amanda rushes in. She saves him from the gargoyle. And then we get another sweet music cue. And the three items that he brought in, he kind of brings out to have a little date with her. (laughs) 
It's like, God, oh, you want some food? You want some of my wine? He uses the knife that was in the skeleton to cut the food and nobody comments. Delicious. Delicious. <laughs> yeah, Yum. is that sanitary? <laughs> <laughs> it's medieval Romania. What do you want? <laughs> <laughs> I really like the chemistry between Amanda and Martin. It's played very oh my God. It's so cute. It is. It's like two kids and they both haven't really... Like he says that, you know, well, you know, I haven't met many girls. So he's like, so like awkward and like shy, but in like a really sweet way. And she's kind of been like locked in her room and like hidden away for probably most of her adolescence. So it's just these two like young, naive, and they're so interested in one another, but they don't really know how to make the first move. I know. So I think the chemistry, yeah. The chemistry they have just works like so well together and it's just so sweet because they come from similar situations but don't really recognize that yeah they're both very much at the i think he likes me i think she likes me <laughs> so amanda screams when martin looks away and this is another near-death experience she screams he says you drank the wine too fast because when you drink wine too fast, it makes you scream. And she passes out, right? That's she true. Faints. She did pass out. She fainted. Oh, that must be what he meant. She drank the wine too fast and she yeah. passed out. Is that where the blade comes like out of yep. the ceiling? Yep. Yeah. Which is kind of a nod to the pit and the pendulum, which oh, Vincent you're right. Price was in. You're right. Yeah. It is. I hadn't thought of that. You're absolutely right. That is a nod to pit and the pendulum. Good old Edgar Allan Poe. So then, I mean, that's pretty much the end of the night, except Amanda gets taken. A Grim Reaper comes out, tries to attack Martin with the sickle. Martin dodges being decapitated and keeps yelling for Amanda. But it's not like an overly concerned, what have you done with Amanda? It's more like, yo, Amanda, what happened? Where are you? (laughs) To be fair, he's not worried about being decapitated either. He's just not worried. He's more going, what's going on? (laughs) And then how did he manage to get the cloak off of that Reaper and then dress up as him? What was that interaction like? I never understood that part. Eric, do you remember? He disappears behind the wall with the Grim Reaper. Yes, yes. And he comes back dressed as a Grim Reaper. That's something. How did that happen? I don't understand. I don't understand what happened. Was he in a fight with the Grim Reaper? Did the Grim Reaper just decide to go streaking? So he put on his cape? I don't know. He killed him and took his cloak? I don't know. Well, he tossed the sexton off a rooftop before without a problem. I don't know. There's some unanswered questions here. Okay, so next morning we get the king and the innkeeper who are arriving, they think, to pick up his body. They're disappointed to find him alive. And he's disappointed that he's still not scared of anything. We go back to the inn, and Frank Zappa keeps trying to give him an apple. And the Georgia girl in me loves that he keeps going for the peach. I don't know Team what... Peach. Team Peach, yes, thank you. I don't think Romania is particularly known for its peaches, but the Georgia girl in me is quite happy with that. That's so funny. I love you. Just keeps like <sighs> on the on the apple. Yeah, you kind of wonder: is it really that he loves the peach, or he just doesn't want to eat the apple that Frank Zappa keeps breathing on? <laughs> breathing on and rubbing under his armpit. Yeah, you know, I'd probably go for the peach too. <laughs> <laughs> Later, I think Frank Zappa even does it when it's not an apple. I think he did it to like a pie or something and ate it anyway. So funny. Uh, It's because it's it's Frank Zappa. We just don't ask questions. So that was a pretty quick little, it's not even much of a scene. It's kind of just a little segue into night two. And he's sitting at the fireplace roasting marshmallows, which if that was one of his three items, I thought that was a much more creative choice this time Mm -hmm. stuck in a castle well might as well have a bonfire and start roasting marshmallows i mean why not you Mm -hmm. know enjoy your time yeah he's got nothing (laughs) else to do well that's how peter mcnichol plays it that's kind of how the script goes he's just bored he's not scared and he's not he's just bored (laughs) <laughs> what else am I going to do? I've explored the castle. I'm not scared of anything. Yeah, I saw a couple ghosts, but whatever. All right, I'll make a marshmallow. You know, he could have had his three objects and gotten some graham crackers and chocolate and made s'mores. 
<laughs> I do love the next scene, and it is oh, very true we... to the book. The next scene, Which scene is this? The headless man finally appears. Yes. Yes. I don't remember that in the story. I kind of thought this was more of a fairy tale theater having fun with it. They even play bowling, but in the book, it, they call it nine pins. Oh, no, it is nine pins. Oh, I, yeah. I got something to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> There's a difference. There's a difference between bowling is and there? nine pins. Yeah, bowling is 12 pins. Nine pins is nine. And there are slightly different rules. Nine, oh. pins, nine pins are, the pins are set up three rows of three and you get one point for every pin but this is so random but my brother was weirdly good at this game this is why i know but if you are able to knock down the middle pin without knocking down any of the others you get 10 points so that's how you win at nine pins you want to aim for the middle pin and not knock down any of the others that's how you score the highest because otherwise the highest you can get is nine. Why do I know this? Anyway, so nine pins is a precursor to bowling. We'll put it that way. I mean, that is a good backstory I could have used as a child because <laughs> I was just like, hey, medieval bowling, right? <laughs> it was very useless trivia, but yeah, nine pins is actually the old English game that preceded bowling, but paid with, I see. Played with nine pins instead of 12. So yeah, we have the headless ghost appearing. That was Gary Schwartz, who also appeared in Thumbelina. I remember that. Oh, yeah. We've got very bad 80s special effects with him juggling his head. Oh my God, it's hilarious. I think that scene as a child probably did freak me out when he's like yes. bouncing his head like a freaking basketball. But I think the part as a kid that really freaked me out, but now it's funny, was when Martin's teaching him how to scream. And that like blood oh, yeah. curdling scream just comes out. Is that what your screams sound like? <laughs> yes, but a little higher pitched. <laughs> I mean, you are a lady. Yeah. And I'm a soprano, so I can go way up there. <laughs> yeah, I love that. And he's teaching him to use his diaphragm. Yeah, throw your shoulders back. There we go. Don't slouch here. I think you got some height you didn't know you had. Mm -hmm. no, real posture. About your howl. I think you're using your voice wrong. You, know, you want to build from here, right? You want to build from here. <coughs> Just, sorry. Uh, listen to me. From here. <laughs> you try it. <laughs> that was a cute moment. And he like corrects his posture. <laughs> You're slouching. Stand up straight. <laughs> You're in the king's castle. Come on. <laughs> Good for him. I love it. So then we meet a couple of his buddies and you can tell, first of all, Martin's not scared at all by any of the ghosts. The other ghosts haven't quite given up on trying to scare him because they're like tossing axes around him. And then he's going, eh, they're not There's even a that snake. Sharp. There's a snake. Now that's the part that bothers me. <laughs> <laughs> and then he just gives it a little pet on the head. Yeah. Eric like knows a good this. boy. Eric knows this about me. You don't I, like snakes? I am petrified of snakes oh just like indiana jones that's right that's right <laughs> i am as brave as indiana jones he's scared of snakes too the snakes give you the shivers it, they do like that's what, I gives, that's what I gives you like the shivers seeing it on the screen i didn't like seeing it on the screen i had to look away because i'm i'm really not good with snakes <laughs> <laughs> um, I was just getting, I think I told you this when we were watching, I got very from the scene with the ghosts where he's playing around with them. It's a lot of physical humor. I was getting very old school Abbott and Costello horror movie vibes. Mm, right. Like very that. It's so, yeah. Weren't all of those guys, some of them were circus performers? Yeah. Um, yes. Okay. Because I think that's in the book that came in the box set or something that has little trivia in it. Because they're low on fire and they're like juggling fire at one point. And it's not anybody just off the street can do that. So <laughs> it's super cool, though. I'd love to see that. Sword swallowing. I've always wanted to see sword swallowing. But what if it goes wrong? Do I want to see it then? <laughs> I think that's true for most circus acts. If it goes wrong, I don't want to see it. <laughs> we'll talk about that book of trivia that came with the DVD set. Do we all have the same set? Do we all own it? The yeah. green one that also came with like the deck of cards. Oh, I've got it. And I noticed that they took a lot of trivia from my old website. <laughs> oh my God. That's hilarious. Be like, I demand credit on oh this, please. God. I demand some royalties. <laughs> that would be nice. 
someone found it. I'm like, well, hey, I had it on my site because I knew it was true. I'm sure they probably checked it. Yeah, she's right. And yeah, it's interesting. So here it is. I'm like, someone was on my site. <laughs> <laughs> we had the bowling and the nine pins. We had some cute little visual gags with the bowler who, oh, it makes sense if he was an acrobat because he. I thought he was doing like ballet moves there. And we had a little jackpot sign when they knocked him down. So that was the end of that night. We have the king and the innkeeper coming back after day two. And remember, no one has survived this far before. Apparently there was one guy that made it the second night, but he was dead the second morning. So they're convinced this guy's going to be dead. I think they're even bringing in a coffin this time. Aren't they like measuring his limbs too, to make sure the coffin's the right size? I think No, that's at the his, beginning. Yeah. They measured his limbs the night before. No, that's right. At yes. the beginning, they, when he first yes, signed at up. The beginning, yeah. yeah, that's right. And they brought but the they coffin. They do bring in the coffin. Again, they're surprised that he's just sleeping, not dead. And I just wrote down, who's more disappointed? The king, the innkeeper, or Martin? They all seem disappointed at how this turned out. We get another scene back at the inn. Poor Amanda is getting really worried. Last night I heard the most awful racket, like thunder crashing down from the heavens. We were just bowling. Bowling? Oh. None of the others ever had a second meal. Oh, except for the redhead. But I didn't like him like I like you. <laughs> Why do you like me? I've never met anybody as brave as you in my whole life. All the others were scared just thinking about going into the castle. But you're different. Oh, di- I'm different, I know. I'm, I, I wish I could be scared. Even just a little. Do you know what I think? All the others wanted the treasure and wished to be king. But you're going in there to prove something to yourself. That's why you've lasted two nights. Don't you think so? What? But Martin, last night I had the most fearful premonition. I saw the evil sorcerer and he was roasting your flesh over the coals of an open fire. Martin, did you hear me? The evil sorcerer himself will surely try to kill you. She had a premonition of the evil sorcerer roasting him on a spit. I don't remember that they mentioned there was an evil sorcerer before. Was it a given? No. Yeah, I don't think they no, ever mentioned they just, that before. I don't think so. Thank you. <laughs> She's like the evil sorcerer himself. I'm going, who's that? Uh, yeah. We knew this place was haunted, but yeah. we didn't know it was by a sorcerer. Didn't know Saruman <laughs> was there. <laughs> <laughs> well said. Very well put, Melina. So Martin's excited when he hears about Amanda's premonition. It's like, that should do it. I'm getting desperate. She's like, that's not the reaction I wanted to hear from you. (laughs) And they have a first kiss. Now, there are some first kisses in... Yeah. (laughs) There wasn't a kiss in Beauty and the Beast. Wasn't it also because they just hated each other? (laughs) Well, that's a different story. Yeah. But anyway, <laughs> moving on. <laughs> but I thought this first kiss between Dana Hill and Peter McNichol, even though calling it a kiss is very generous, it's just a little peck. But it just seemed so sweet. And the way it was lit, the way you had the music in the background, and also I think the way Dana Hill played it, you totally are invested. You totally believe that this is a really important moment for her. Not so much for Martin, but for her, this is a big deal. I thought that was so beautifully played. I agree. It's like she's blossoming. Yeah. So we got the third night in the castle and Martin's bored again. Okay. And we get the big Dracula moment with them walking in with the coffin and -hmm. the coffin opens by itself. How many homages to Dracula can we fit in 45 minutes? (laughs) I love this. And I love, I think I talked to you about, I think some of these things maybe were brought in when he was in Dracula Dead and Loving It in the 90s. Oh, I hadn't thought of that. Yeah, I thought that was pretty cool. Peter McNichol was in that. There's a coffin scene and there's... He's like a henchman, isn't he? Yeah, he plays Dracula's henchman, yeah. Oh my God, I completely forgot this. And a lot of the things were drawn in from this, from these scenes in the castle. The coffin, yeah. Wow, you... (laughs) <laughs> I don't think I've seen that since it came out. And that came out in like 95, I want to say. Yeah. Good eye. Yeah, it's been a while but since I've watched I've that seen one it. so many times. So good. I'm going to have to rewatch it now just for yeah. what you just said. 
(laughs) (laughs) I need to revisit that one. Yes. Martin looks in the coffin. He can't see in there. So he goes to get a torch. He turns around and Sir Christopher Lee in all his glory is standing there dressed in a carpet. I wrote down. Dressed in a carpet. (laughs) I'm sorry. Do we want to talk about the costumes? (laughs) It almost looks like almost like a velvet, but not. It almost looks like it came from a couch. It did. It doesn't look elegant. It doesn't look magical. Maybe it was a rich fabric that just didn't photograph well. I just wrote down he's dressed in a carpet, but he's Christopher Lee, so he looks elegant in anything. I did notice this is the very first time we get anything resembling worry from Martin Because when he turns around and he sees Christopher Lee standing there, he says, kind of quietly, but he says, "Uh (laughs) uh-oh. This is the very first time I've ever seen Martin remotely worried about anything. He's going, "Uh (laughs) uh-oh. Which I think all of us could relate to if we were stuck in a castle and Christopher Lee just walks out of a coffin. I think all of us would at least say, "Uh (laughs) uh-oh. So we have Christopher Lee giving his monologue about how you must think yourself a worthy opponent. Martin kind of just shrugs. He's like, I don't know. I'm kind of just here for the ride. (laughs) And he says, well, you're going to die. And Martin's going, "Mm, okay. And he's going, look at your death. And it's a picture of Martin being spun over a spit on an open flame, which- Apple in mouth and all. I know. (laughs) Which supposedly was Amanda's vision. Remember, she said, I saw him roasting you on an open flame. And the image of him with an apple in his mouth and his tights, and every, it's hysterical. And Martin had the same reaction I did. Are you trying your hardest? <laughs> it's not scary at all. It's hilarious. What should I be scared it's so of? so funny. So funny. And then he uses his hands and sends off laser beams, I guess. I didn't quite understand this part. It's very 80s. Yes. It's, it's very it, similar to the Rapunzel beams. Oh, you're right. You're absolutely right. I'm kind of just going, what's the magician going for exactly? He's shooting lasers off his hands. Okay. Then Martin holds up his plate. This is where I find out that the plate was useful. And finally, send, yeah, finally sends it right back to the sorcerer. And I wrote down Perseus in Clash of the Titans. Do you remember okay. <laughs> Perseus Shield in Clash of the Titans. I think it had come out like a couple years before. And that was the trick Perseus used. Harry Hamlin used his mirror on his shield to do the laser beams, which were a similar effect right back at Medusa. That was what that reminded me of. And we get Christopher Lee getting a taste of his own medicine. I guess, although it was going to kill Martin, it just made Christopher Lee extremely uncomfortable. And then Martin trips him, rolls him in a rug, and tickles him with the fringe. Okay, this is not a scary episode. Yeah, it's a little weird. Like I said, Shelley's trying to tone it down, but there's toning it down and toning it down too much. He's tickling him with the fringe, and he's threatening to jump on him. He weighs like a hundred pounds soaking wet. So I I don't know. Like seven feet tall. Come on. (laughs) With his really intimidating green type. Yeah. Against Lord Summer Isle. Come on, people. (laughs) But this is where we find out that the sorcerer was actually King Vladimir in disguise. He was haunting his own castle because he didn't want to lose his daughter. Everyone say, aw. Aw. (laughs) I got you. (laughs) Thank you. Is that really? Which is actually kind of sweet. It is, but it's, they're sweet. And then there's, as Dangerly Andrews would say, saccharine. Too sweet. Yes, (laughs) that too. Too sweet. It's like, I get she's considered your property in this day and age, but. (laughs) Exactly. Was that in the original story? He was hunting his own castle because he didn't want to lose his daughter. It's very similar. Yeah. And also he didn't want to give up his gold. That makes more sense. Okay. <laughs> yeah. That, that makes a lot more sense. Okay. Didn't want to appoint an heir and lose his gold. Then his daughter kind of goes along with the bargain. That seems a lot more historically accurate. But this episode does have a very sweet ending. So it is kind of sweet how he goes, no, I just didn't want to lose my daughter. And Aww. Sudden, yeah, thank you, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> 
So all of a sudden, Martin's point of view completely changes and apologizes and flips him out of the rug, which was a cute special. <laughs> that was a cute moment. I don't know if that was actually <laughs> Christopher Lee rolling around in the carpet, but that was a cute moment. And he says, well, you've done it. You have survived and you're going to get the castle. And then he does such a British thing. He mumbles under his breath. Frankly, I'm sick of the place anyway. You have no idea how much it costs to heat it. <laughs> Classic Brit. <laughs> it's like, well, um, can we talk about how the king had powers as the sorcerer? How did that happen? Yeah, how did he I, have the laser beams? Thank you. I yeah, I had that too. I'm going, where did these powers come from? Was he always a sorcerer? Did right. he or like moonlighting like as a sorcerer? <laughs> moonlighting as a sorcerer. <laughs> Lighting as a sorcerer. Apparently he was because he was, you know, being king by day and sorcerer by night. And <laughs> kind of wonder who all was in on this with him. Yeah. Like, did the innkeeper know as well? Did like. Did his daughter know? Because he was apparently killing a bunch of innocent men who were trying to win. Or am I thinking too far into this? I'm not supposed to think that far into it, right? No, Go as far I mean, as you, you can. Want. <laughs> yeah so it was the king being the sorcerer in the original tale right yes he's like haunting his own castle and then his dead cousin is also it's very it's very random my dead cousin was here and there was an old man and with a beard and he showed up and he showed me a lot of money down in the cellar and the king's like yeah i don't want to give up my gold and my dead cousin was haunting it it's really like yeah the gold was brought up and the wedding was celebrated <laughs> I'm confused. Yeah. So in the story, the king was like partnering up with like the ghost of his dead cousin. Oh. And it's one line. That's it's oh. one line. My dead cousin was here. Okay. <laughs> like, that's it. There's like no backstory. That's it. Well, you know, with the Brothers Grimm, it never quite says why the evil queen was a witch. She just was. I guess we're more used to it with women characters. We're not so used to it. Exactly, with right. I we had- can just write our own fan fiction and figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, but actually, that's interesting. I, I think we're just not used to seeing it so much in men characters in fairy tale. So yeah, there you go. That's true. Representation, Eric. <laughs> All right. So we have the king and the innkeeper coming back after the third morning. And this time, they're not surprised at all that he's alive. They were expecting it because, well, the king was there last night, so he knows. And he says, well, you've done it. You've won. And here's my greatest treasure. (sighs) Thank heaven you're all right. Heaven had nothing to do with it, my dear. Martin's far too clever to be scared. You're the princess? Yes, Martin, I am. This moment meant a lot to me because this is Dana Hill's moment in the sun she gets to her beautiful dress she is the beautiful fairy tale princess i wanted to be her in this scene i guess it's because she had such a tragically short life cut short by diabetes this moment means a lot for me as a fan of hers no i agree it's with very you cute. it's super sweet mm-hmm. so she comes up and she's revealed to be the princess And she announces to her father very proudly that we have even kissed. And Christopher Mm -hmm. Lee does a great British father going, not sure I entirely approve, but okay, you're getting married. So that's, I guess, I'll look the other way. He had one daughter Mm -hmm. in real life too. Oh, I didn't know that. Her name is Christina. Yeah, her name is Christina. I know Vincent Price had a daughter named Victoria. (laughs) Did you know that Vincent Price and Christopher Lee have the same birthday? And they used to have joint birthday parties together. And one of them was at Madame Tussauds in London. Oh my God, how cool were these guys? <laughs> Although I'll tell you this, my, my favorite story about Vincent Price and Dracula was Bela Lugosi when he died, the original Dracula. Apparently Vincent Price and Peter Lorre were at the viewing and Bela Lugosi was buried in his Dracula cape. And Vincent Aww. Max. Yeah, and Vincent Price was standing next to Peter Lorre and they're both just... So sad, you know, that this great actor came to such a sad ending and they're overcome with grief. And apparently Peter Lorre quipped, should we drive a stake in his heart just to be sure? (laughs) That's hysterical. said, I felt so bad for laughing. (laughs) He's like, 
I'm standing there. I'm supposed to be calm and somber and leave it to Peter to crack that joke and wait until that moment to crack that joke. So he's standing there with his shoulders shaking. He said, I looked over at Peter and he just had this wicked grin on his face. Sometimes you need to laugh. That's so funny. <laughs> hey, we're, we're <laughs> almost there. We're at Amanda announces that she's already got her wedding dress picked out. And she already has baby names picked out. <laughs> and and Lars. Oh, Lars. <laughs> Igor and Lars. <laughs> and that's when he starts to shake. Oh, Lars. <laughs> yeah. And that's a very cute addition made by Fairy Tale Theater that that's how Martin gets the shivers. What he's really scared of is growing up and falling in love. Growing up. <laughs> yes. Aww. It's it adorable. Is, it is sweet. I love her dress in the next scene when they're sitting on their oh, thrones. That icy She blue. looks so pretty. That oh, beautiful. Oh, that was a great color for her. I agree. I think Dana Hill never looked lovelier. So they're married now. We cut to them married and Martin finally gets a good outfit. I think he's wearing the same crown Rene Abergen Wild War in. I was gonna freaking say that. I was like, it looks like the one from Frog Prince, man. And his head is so small that it just looks so big. <laughs> it should sure look like that. His head looks so small. <laughs> it's hilarious. Okay, so Frank Zappa again tries to offer him an apple by huffing on it. And Martin still picks the peach. And Amanda has the blues. And Martin realizes he's never had the blues. So What are the blues? When I know them, if I had them. So that's Have you ever felt emotion? <laughs> That's a good question. Well, he finally got fear. And no, that's a good question. <laughs> right. Have you felt emotion? <laughs> I don't have a good answer to that. <laughs> I know, right? Well, I mean, but I love her sigh. It's just so dainty and ladylike. Just the, <sighs> <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> Nothing. I guess I have. She plays it so well. She does. She, I think she would have excelled in more leading lady roles had she been given the opportunity. I think so too. It's sad we lost her so young, but she did go into voice work later in her career. I think she did a lot of Disney voice work, if I'm not mistaken. I think she was in Darkwing Duck. And But what happened was she had type 1 diabetes and it stunted her growth. And it also made her skin appear very puffy. So this is when she was her most beautiful. She was like about 21 here. But the diabetes affected her physical appearance so that's why she went into voice work and then she died in her early 30s so she it was said her diabetes ended a promising future in athletics when she was 10 years old what did she play i think she was a runner if i am remembering correctly oh huh interesting yeah so can we talk about her little appearance in the grim party special where she's in like the bunny costume and talking about why the episode is so important to learn how to overcome your fears oh. that's really sweet that was sweet. I don't remember exactly what she said. Do you? Something along the lines of you have to like put yourself out there and see what's out there and conquer your fears because there's always going to be like obstacles in life. It's something along those lines, but it's very true. And she oh, just says it with a smile on her face and is very convincing, very motivational speaker like and <laughs> all while her. wearing a bunny costume. But that makes sense for her because she was very much overcoming her physical limitations to try and be a leading actress. Well, yes. She so she's a very inspirational young lady. I admire her spirit very much. Okay. So we made it through the recap. <laughs> Yay. I'm just having so much fun. I feel like I'm at a party. Aww. <laughs> well, welcome, Melina. We're so happy to have you. Welcome oh, to our world. Thank you so much. <laughs> and one of my bestest friends who's also named Emily, she lives in Australia. She's the one who got me in Hammer Horror. I remember I showed oh. her this episode for the first time. Oh. She knew about the series and she had seen Snow White because of Vincent Price, but she didn't know they were kind of in this one together. Wow. So we watched it together over Zoom. This was pre-pandemic. And the entire time she was like, ah, just like freaking out and was like so excited and was like telling there's me like so little facts and little trivia. Jokes. Yeah. There's so oh many. Oh my God. There's jokes. so many. Yeah. I love but it. Yeah. So the joy of fairy tale theater continues. Absolutely. That's why we're still here talking about it. I okay. love that I found a community and people I can talk to about it. <laughs> and we're here for you. <laughs> 
Okay. Yes, we are. So summing up, what were your favorite things and least favorite things about this episode? Eric, I'm going to go to you first. Uh, favorite things. I think I loved, I, I think I said all the comedy horror references. I loved the physical humor of it. I loved the kind of spooky, but yet really comedic parts of it. I think that's what makes this episode stand out for me. Least favorite parts? I don't think I have any least favorite parts. Like, I really enjoy this episode overall. That's a big compliment. Yeah. That's a very big compliment. You, you and I can be pretty picky sometimes. <laughs> yeah, it's just solid for me. I don't know. It's a solid episode for me. Very cool. Mm-hmm. I'll, I'll say for me, and I hadn't quite realized how many homages there were to the old Hammer films until... I mean, I guess I kind of subconsciously knew, but this last rewatch really brought it out. And I I love that. I love the old Roger Corman, Vincent Price movies. <laughs> I love catching all those little inside references. It was a great cast. This was probably the perfect cast from Frank Zappa. Didn't have a line to <laughs> adorable Peter McNichol. Just the cast was on point all around. I think my least favorite things, it seemed to drag on a little. I think the pacing was a little slow at parts, although they did their best, but something about it seemed to drag and I can't quite put my finger on what that was or how to fix it. That, that's my one critique. Melina? I love like the gothic setting and I love how this one, like we said at the beginning, was super spooky and more darker than the other episodes. So I kind of like how they ventured down that path. Again, I love the cast. They just, I love how they just cast a horror giant in this. It's just like a so horror fun. giant. <laughs> a right. <laughs> Which one well, are you talking two about? Two horror there? giants. <laughs> but two of them. Both of them. Yeah, it's just so fitting. I think my least favorite part, because just because it's kind of like comical. The lightsabers coming out of the eyes. I know it's kind of like foreshadowing into the future of Christopher Lee's career. (laughs) No, that's a good point. But yeah, it just didn't really make sense. If I think it would have made more sense if he had pulled out a wand or lit some shit on fire. Can I curse on this? Sorry. Go for it. Yeah. So that was probably just my least favorite part. If he went all Voldemort. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And also the jumping up and down while he's in the little rug come uh, on uh, that didn't... you're like you're the size of a child what what do you plan on doing <laughs> uh, that, that didn't seem quite right yeah but overall i think it holds up oh and- overall and i love all the nods to all the old horror movies so eric have you found anything from my past to haunt me with you know how we love that tripod side of yours emily i know the one <laughs> I know the one. Oh, uh, and the spinning stars. Oh my God. They're like the perfect touch. I think I put that up in 1998, I think. Circa 1998. Does it tell you on here? No, I'm just remembering because <laughs> I was, I know I was in high school. So should I read your review? Yes, please. Or do we want to do our I can hear the first? cringe in your voice. <laughs> <laughs> I am. I do not remember what I wrote about this episode at all. Some of them I remember very vividly. Some of them I have no memory. I, I really do not remember what I wrote about this episode. So you gave it three stars and you said pretty spooky, but a lot of fun. This is another personal favorite of mine, mostly because it is so unique. Based on a not-so-well-known tale from the Brothers Grimm, this is the tale of a boy who has never known fear. A very young Peter McNichol stars as Martin and gives a hysterical performance being driven from his home by his paranoid family. Martin sets forth to discover the shivers. Answering a proclamation to rid a haunted castle of ghosts, he goes through one terrifying night after another, completely unafraid. While Martin's unafraid, I should warn you, the castle scenes scared the heck out of me when I was little. <laughs> <laughs> they did? <laughs> okay. Still lovely. Amanda, played by Dana Hill, keeps him company at the inn, as does David Warner. Christopher Lee is typecast as the spooky king, and Vincent Price does the narration. All in all, the atmosphere of this episode is definitely achieved and brings a very good fairy tale to a new life. Wow. I really liked it when I wrote that. (laughs) 
I guess I had some mixed things because I there were parts I really liked and I stand behind a lot of that, but I don't remember finding any of it actually scary, scary. But I also remember I was writing that website with the idea that kids might be looking for it. So I was trying to do little warnings. I know I did one for the Nightingale too. I know I warned about a scene. I was one of those kids. (laughs) The Nightingale scared me. I don't remember Boy Who Left Home scaring me, but Nightingale scared me. (laughs) Sleeping Beauty scared me. Beverly D'Angelo was like a little too much for me. It was like a lot. Oh, Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. That's that's interesting. I, I really sound in love with the episode. Okay. So I, I really liked it, but I didn't adore it. Okay. Yeah. I guess I mostly stand by it. I guess I'd give it like a seven out of 10, just because I do think the beginning dragged the scenes with the family at the beginning and the sexton. And I don't know, I kind of think we could have cut a bunch of that, maybe started with him at the inn and had a little backstory. Maybe that's how I would have fixed it. I don't know. Okay. That's not one of my most embarrassing reviews that have come back to haunt me. (laughs) Okay. So Eric, you go first. I would go probably eight out of 10. Okay. Like they said, it's a very solid episode. It's not my favorite by any means, but I do think it's very memorable. And I do think that it's it's one that I like. It's a good one. Yeah. I would definitely give an eight out of 10. It's memorable. I'll I'll definitely agree with that. It's very unique. Melina? Yeah, I'm probably around the same. 7.5 to 8 out of 10. (laughs) Because I, again, I just like love anything medieval and supernatural. It's kind of what I'm drawn towards. Anything with castles, I think, which is why I really like this episode too. And again, I love the humor and I just love how naive and how unafraid Martin is. And then we learn what he really is. (laughs) Okay. And like I said, I'm at about a seven out of 10. I really like it. I love how unique it is. Just, I think some things were a little slow, but a lot of it I really, really enjoy. Going forward, we talked a little bit about this. Are there any takeaways for us? Eric, for me, you reminded me, I'm going to look up Dracula Dead and Loving It. I have not watched that movie in probably 20 years. Now I really want to bring that up again. I've also got a lot of different remakes of Dracula that I've had on my shelf for forever, but haven't watched. I know there's a Jack Palance version, a Louis Jordan version. I even want to watch the old Bela Lugosi and Christopher Lee versions. I'm, I might do a, a uh, rewatch over here. <laughs> so good. The Horror of Dracula is my personal favorite one. I just also love Peter Cushing as Van Helsing. And they were also friends. So The Horror of Dracula. Which one's that one? It's from 1958, I believe. With Christopher Lee as Dracula. Okay, that is the Christopher Lee one. Okay, I have it. I, <laughs> I have it. I don't think I've watched it all the way through. Yeah, I've never watched that version. And then there's also the great soap opera Dark Shadows, which was also somewhat... In- <laughs> Eric knows where I'm going with this. Don't get Emily started on Dark Shadows. So, yeah, as... Some of you know, I am a big fan of the old soap opera, Dark Shadows. Part of it was inspired by Dracula. And actually, it turns out, I found out in later years, our great David Warner from this episode, big fan of Dark Shadows, and was even in some of the sequel series that were made not that long ago. There's another connection there. Very cool. (laughs) Okay, were there any takeaways for you, Eric, from this? Takeaways... Like anything you want to learn more about, actor, source material? Well, I would love, now that Melina was talking about like the Hammer Horror, I really haven't seen any of the Hammer Horror films. So now that's something I would definitely look into for sure. Oh, they're fun. They are a lot of fun. They're so fun. So fun. A lot of them directed by Roger Corman. (laughs) And Eric, we saw a musical based on one of Roger Corman's films, Little Shop of Horrors. Oh, Little Shop? Oh, that's one of the films? Well, that's not Hammer Horror, but that was a Roger Corman. That's very much in his style. Uh, oh, okay. Huh. Yeah. I didn't know that. Weird and very much out there. <laughs> yeah, Roger yeah, Corman I'm... directed a ton of them. Very cool. Yeah, we went to see Little Shop of Horrors off Broadway a couple of weeks ago. Oh, that's cool. Anyway, so Melina, any takeaways for you? I've always been really interested in like behind the scenes with like anything that I watch. So I think I want to know like, 
what Shelley's pitch was to Christopher Lee and Vincent Price, or if they were on board, like right away. I think that's what I would want to know more about. Good question. And if they had, and if like they had have said no, like, did she have a backup plan? She always had a backup plan. That's true. And a backup plan for the backup plan. Yeah. That's how she ended up playing Rapunzel herself. (laughs) Wasn't that how Rumpel, how like Rumpelstiltskin happened too? Because didn't she originally want Madonna? No, Madonna was going to be Rapunzel, I think. Oh, I thought she was going to be the Miller's daughter. I'm getting my R's mixed up. I'm pretty sure Rumpelstiltskin was always going to be Shelley. Yeah, she really about, liked okay. that red wig. She wanted to wear that red wig really badly. So Yeah, and, that, oh my and God, that's so cute. It was only the second episode, so. That's true. It was still really new. Yeah, but she said uh, most of the time when she popped up and she wasn't actually just doing the intro, most of the time it was because someone pulled out at the last minute. <laughs> Is that why she played Snow White's mother as well? I think there was someone else who was slated for that cameo, but I don't know who. Well, I guess that's a wrap. Thank you for joining us for tonight's tale. I'm Eric. I'm Emily. And I'm Melina. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. And remember to live happily ever after. Thank you and good night.